Thank you, Eric. Um, so today we're, we're going to speak about uh, trust, nothing, zero trust, you know, uh, and it's about, you know, how we can securely connect any service uh, and how can console help deliver this outcome. Uh, so my name is Tony. I'm, I'm a technical specialist, uh, part of the emerging products team here in, uh, in the region in APJ. Um, and we're just going to talk through this again. Any questions, please ask. I have a very quick demo a uh, super lightning quick demo at the end, uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, first thing I notice is that the, the year is wrong, even though I did change the copyright, um, but I didn't change the actual presentation year. Anyway, that was my bad, but this is, this is current. So um, this session is going to focus predominantly on console and you know, what we call um, machine to machine access or service to service. Uh, uh, is, is commonly known for, right? Um, there's other parts of our HashiCorp's zero trust narrative. Uh, with Vault, it's machine authentication and authorization. With Boundary, it's human to machine access. I won't cover those topics today, but if there's interest, please reach out. So let's start uh, by understanding or talking about some of the history, right? Uh, look, securing a data center was easy, uh, emphasize was, right? Um, what we had before was, you know, and, and a lot of customers and organizations still have this today, so this is still relevant. Um, you know, all unauthorized traffic or access could be, you know, fairly easily managed, you know, restricted and blocked, allowed or denied. You know, we're dealing with, you know, less scale, you know, more long-lived workloads um, compared to now. Um, and then we also had networks that were typically trusted, you know, with different segments or zone. You know, we started building... DMZs, you know, private network segments. And, and, you know, usually with those private network segments, they were fairly trusted or classified in that way. Um, but, you know, this exposed, you know, a number of weaknesses. Usually the, the first weakness is, you know, if you were granted access to a private network segment, you were considered trusted and you could go anywhere within that segment. And those segments could be very large, right? Um, we had corridors between, you know, DMZ and, and private networks, right? So if, as long as you could enter and go through those corridors, again, you could access anything behind it. But, you know, also, and I think, you know, to, to really emphasize today's point uh, or, or discussion, generally traffic was unencrypted. So we're going to talk a lot about kind of zero trust, trust nothing, encryption, so forth. Uh, the whole idea with this is service-to-service -service communication that you know, can run on an untrusted network, even though if you trust your, your existing network and so forth, you have the ability to always guarantee uh, a few principles uh, that will always be there, right? Uh, regardless if you run on you know, private data centers or private cloud or in public cloud or connecting to external services. Uh, so with that, let's, let's have a look at a few things and kind of compare where we are today, right, as well. So, we take we kind of look at these approaches of traditional data center is often related to static, right? Uh, what I mean by static is, you know, you can look at things that don't typically change, like I mentioned before. You had, you know, physical, or you had networks, firewalls, you know, IP-based perimeters and, and security. Uh, whereas, you know, a lot of workloads we're looking at today are more modern or they're based in the modern data center and more dynamic in nature. So a simple example of dynamic you know, we can just look at IP addressing, right? Previously, before they were static, they're long lived. Uh, often they'll, they'll use this on identity. So, what I mean is when you refer to a workload, you would refer to the IP address. That IP address will be used in firewall policies for access deny. Who could access that IP? Who could not access that IP? Now, things, things are challenging now as, you know, we, we're seeing organizations, you know, adopt cloud, re platform, uh, and scale. Right. We all know the story around monolithic to, to microservices. Um, but when they start to scale, IP is, again, very, you know, IP is not long-lived anymore. They're short-lived. They could be dynamic in nature, DHCP. So it becomes difficult to scale and, and continue to configure. And just think about configuring firewall, load balances, traditional uh, security devices um, using, you know, static uh, IP addressing or short-lived, or sorry, long-lived or short-lived um, <laughs> Um, IP addresses um, in these devices that change and constantly go up and down a lot, right? It becomes challenging. Myself, just thinking about it, I kind of just, my, my mind just went haywire just then, right? So, you know, console helps facilitate this security from service to service uh, easily. 
But first, let's just take a step back. What is console? So for those who haven't, you know, been on previous webinars or snapshots or heard me talk about console, you know, console at its core is a service networking solution that enables organizations to discover and connect applications running across multiple environments. And it does this by leveraging what we call, you know, uh, a service registry or shared registry. This provides a real-time up-to-date list of these services that are deployed in infrastructure. It also tracks the health of them. So regardless, if you spin up a virtual machine, if you deploy containers on Kubernetes, these services, as they come online, they register themselves with console, console will track them. Um, there are a number of use cases that, you know, facilitate, you know, uh, the registration, the service, re service registry. You know, we can talk about load balancing, health monitoring, DNS, but today we're going to focus on um, the service mesh side. Uh, that is what's going to deliver kind of the zero trust or enable uh, us to securely connect services together using uh, mutual TLS, uh, but also facilitate, you know, other outcomes such as deployment patterns with traffic management, you know, canary, blue, green, and so forth, right? Um, better observability as well. Uh, and just simplified connectivity between multiple clouds and multiple environments. Uh, the, the other use cases are around network infrastructure automation. Based off services registering, uh, we can essentially automate um, uh, infrastructure, right? And it's driven, you can kind of compare this to event-driven automation. So focusing on console service mesh, it's about improving kind of the, the enterprise security posture based off identity uh, and authorization and access controls. Uh, at that level, but also providing, you know, fully encrypted um, communication, right? So we want to reduce, reduce the likelihood of any breach um, and, and any, you know, secret sprawl by authenticator authorizing every service and every communication. And we'll go more on this as, as we go on the next, next 10 minutes or so. Um, Again, I spoke of this, some call this zero trust. Let's move on. Um, so what, what matters? Uh, there's a few principles of zero trust. And the first one is about being identity driven. Um, you know, we, IP doesn't work anymore in this dynamic era, especially as we start to consider, you know, IP addressing or, or this, this kind of mixed multi-cloud environment, right? Uh, you could in fact have duplicate IPs, right? Or duplicate subnets. Uh, again, to that nature, you could, you know, have very short-lived IPs. We need a new way to identify these services. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, they must be identity-driven. For us, that is a TLS certificate, um, you know, that has a chain or, or a chain and a root of trust. Um, so at each, each level, it can be verified that, you know, that certificate is in fact trusted by something higher, right? Uh, yeah. The other element is it must be mutually authenticated. Uh, so both services, source and destination, must present a certificate um, that ensure they are both valid. All right. So, you know, they, in fact, the service they call themselves or represent uh, to be, right? They must be authorized. Uh, so not only at the TLS level uh, or certificate level, uh, things must meet that criteria like expiry and so forth, uh, naming. Um, but, you know, we also have a policy, which what we call intentions, right? Is service A actually allowed to talk to service B? Is service B actually allowed to talk to service C and nothing else, right? Some call this micro segmentation. We call it service, service permission. Uh, this can be as granular and flexible uh, as we like, right? The other element is time bound, right? We don't also, we don't want these certificates to be long lived. So, you know, how do we keep them short lived and how do we rotate them automatically as well? All right. So time downing is important here and it serves a number of use cases. Um, we can talk more about that in a little bit as well. Uh, but the main thing here is ensuring that, you know, regardless, you know, whether the application is, you know, is encrypted, um, uh, by, by nature, um, HTTPS or something like that, or the encryption is built in, uh, what we can do is guarantee when, you know, transparently as well, when service A wants to talk to service B, that communication is encrypted at that level, right? And it's transparent to the application. That's a key point here. Um, anything we do here uh, in terms of encryption is transparent, right? 
And then we want to make sure that everything is logged and audited. Um, so if you know one service is not allowed to talk to that service, we want to log that deny. If it is allowed, then we, we may want to log that as well, right? Um, but these are some of the principles uh, that really ensure a rig, you know, a tight security posture uh, when it comes to access and communication. So let's talk through about well, let's talk through what console does. Uh, so console provides, uh, and some call this console connect, uh, we some call this console service mesh, but in general, you know, console provides each service with an identity, you know, as a TLS certificate. This certificate is, is again used to establish and accept communications to and from other services. You know, the identity of that service is encoded in this TLS certificate, um, but also complies with the SPIFI or SPIFI uh, framework. So it's good to know that we comply with an existing standard. Um, and this is used to, yeah, again, establish connections and it can be used to establish connections with other SPIFI compliant systems as well. Uh, console will actually generate and distribute these certificates. Uh, it has a built-in CA, so there's no other dependencies that are required. Um, but it does ship in, it does ship with built-in support for something like, you know, HashiCorp Vault. Um, if you have another third-party CA, then it's also pluggable um, and plays nicely with that as well. Again, just to summarize, you know, every service has a TLS certificate uh, upon registration. You know, it is used to identify itself. Console has built-in mechanism to rotate the certificates as well. Now, so let's look at the flow of communication and just talk through this for a sec. So what we see here is a web service that wants to talk to a database service. Within our service mesh, we use Envoy um, as a proxy. In this case, it's, it's a proxy sitting, or we consider that a sidecar proxy that's sitting next to the application itself. When the web service wants to talk to the database service, what happens is, it will actually, again, go via the proxy transparently, um, and then it will go, where's my database? All right, this is part of the service registry. Then console will return the database. Now, if you had you know, multiple instances of the database, then console will return the healthy one. Um, and then you know, the proxy will start to establish a TLS handshake with it. Now, you know, the, the client certificate verifies the destination service certificate against, you know, a public CA bundle. So there's some verification um, of certificates on both sides. You know, this is very similar to kind of HTTPS web browser connections. Um, we're verifying both hand sides. If both are verified, uh, then we kind of move on to the next step. The next step is, is it authorized? Again, this is, I was talking about console intentions or service to service permissions. So are we actually allowing web service to talk to the database service? You know, we can do this in layer four, we can do uh, create intentions where the layer seven as well, right? Um, but if they are authorized, then what happens is we have a connection that's established and we call that mutual TLS. So, you know, let me quickly go through and uh, give you a demo of, you know, um, uh, console, this will be a very quick demo. I kind of just walk through the flow of establishing a connection. Um, by default, I uh, just want to indicate by default, uh, mutual TLS or you know, service mesh encryption is on by default. Um, so there really isn't any you know, much configuration to it or anything to demonstrate on that side. Uh, same with the built-in CA. As soon as we register a service, uh, a TLS certificate is assigned. To, and that's what I'm just going to demonstrate now. So we actually, at the moment, this is the console UI and console can be administered through the UI, like you see here through the API or CLI. I have some, you know, I really don't have any services besides console itself and a few, few gateways like the ingress gateway. Uh, but what, what I'm going to do is quickly just deploy HashiCups. We just wait for that. Um, there's a few things that are deploying with it. Uh, I'm applying a few CIDs to configure the service to service permissions as well. So we can see that if we go to intentions, you can see here that now I'm allowing uh, these back end services or these front end services to talk to each other. Let's just wait uh, until they come up. So they're coming up now. If I go back to console, just waiting for one service to appear. Why we wait for that, if I go on the front end service, 
you can see there's a number of instances. There's two instances behind it. Uh, we are monitoring some health as well, uh, just to make sure it's all good. Uh, there's also a topology view as well, but I'll go back for now. Now, I just wanted to show you uh, what a TLS certificate looks like for the front end server. So I, I just ran a, ran a quick curl. Um, again, ignore the insecure. It's, it's, it's uh, my demo environment. Um, but I'm looking at the front end certificate here. And I can see um, the issuing on that, that, that is the console C8 itself. Uh, one thing to notice is have a look at the before and after, uh, the expiry. So that, that is roughly uh, about 72, three days, right? 72 hours. So they're very short lived certificates, but again, console will automatically rotate these. Uh, you don't need to worry about them. This is using the built in CA. Right? Uh, so this is what a client certificate looks like or the service certificate for the front end. Uh, you can see here we're complying with the Spiffy or Spiffy uh, framework, uh, and you can see the, the domain address and so forth associated here. So every certificate, again, that is registered in the console and participates in the mesh is identified using a TLS certificate. Uh, regardless, I mean, console is aware of the service's IP address or the instance IP address, but the identity is now a TLS certificate and we use that identity to, again, authenticate and authorize the connection. Right. So everything's fully encrypted. Um, just to wrap it up quickly, this is my ingress. If I refresh that, I should see uh, the application come up, come up, and you know every service that's talking here is, is fully encrypted. So quite a simple uh, piece to show. It, it's really baked into you know the core console, um, and and that's that's really it. Handing back to yourself, Eric. All right, thanks, Tony.